Hey YouTube, it's Cello Ben, and welcome back to another Cello class. I'm joined here with Tally, and we're going to be talking technique today. Um, so you and I welcome. First of all, we uh, we discussed uh, when we were planning for this a little bit about you know just kind of talking about some general technical things, um, and it's often both fun and useful to really revisit this nitty gritty of cello playing to kind of uh, recoup our fundamentals and make sure that they're really, really well in shape and that we have a good baseline to go from. Um, and especially during this, this lockdown, it's something that I want to start doing more as well and just kind of getting back to basics and um, really woodshedding my techniques. So what is it that you think is the thing that you want to revisit the most nowadays? Hmm, I think on some levels probably shifting. My shifting can get a little sloppy and get kind of guessworky. Um, and then I was realizing like my fourth finger, for example, my fourth finger of vibrato is still pretty weak. So certain, I guess vibrato in general, certain things that I just kind of assumed I know how to do and it, it right. gets, you know, but it goes by the way said. Right. I mean, I think there are a lot of these, there are a lot of these various techniques that we sort of start doing automatically before right. we actually have like a, an intellectual baseline for how they work. Like I didn't, it was a long time after I started playing cello before I actually learned, you know, the mechanics of how shifting works. Mm -hmm. um, can you just, can you just show me a shift or two? Sure. So, well, one of my, you know, favorite ones is if you're coming up to fourth position, if you're going up here and then I would just kind of slide right up. Mm -hmm. um, something a little, maybe if I'm coming like up here mm -hmm. without looking, mm -hmm. things like that. And w do you feel like it's, when you encounter a problem with it, is it usually a smoothness problem or is it an accuracy thing that happens? Accuracy, I'd say, yeah. Okay, right. Um, first of all, a good rule of thumb with shifting, it's not always true, but it's something that I've found to be true in an enormous amount of cases, is that you have more time than you think. Um, especially if you're performing, uh, you might be just really really stressing a shift and being like, I got to make it, got to make it, got to make it. And then you just shoot your hand up and hope for the best. But yes. <laughs> um, the reality is that you usually have a lot more time than you, I'll take. Do you know the Brahms second piano concerto? I'm not playing it off the top of my head, but I recognize it. Right. Yes. Well, there's a beautiful, beautiful, huge cello solo in the third movement. And there's this one big shift. It's really awkward. You have to get all the way up there and try to make it sound beautiful. And I've been, I was practicing this. Um, and and that, what I just did sounded in time, right? Mm -hmm. To me, it felt like an eternity. Uh, I felt like I was just waiting and waiting and waiting and I was never going to actually go up there. Right. But one, one thing that can be useful is to record yourself and just think to yourself how much time you really do have. Um, but the next thing, which I'll talk about more in depth, is the fact that um, when you're talking timing, you want to figure out what you're going to do with that time. Um, and the way that I was taught to approach shifting was as a very, very fluid motion. Um, and also a motion that has sort of a, a clear chain of command because it's not just, um, it actually originates far before that, um, in the arm and maybe even in the shoulder, um, because shifts need to be prepared. So... I was actually taught, I was taught shifting like that with, with um, the analogy of like throwing a ball. Um, and 
if you so if I try to do it without doing anything with my arm, say it's not accurate really. But if I use my arm to propel me, not only um, is it probably going to be more accurate, but I'm also going to actually be using less energy in my small muscles, and it's going to help so I don't get so you know worn out easily. And because I'm I'm leading with the elbow and even further up than that. Nice. So I Lots can you that? try once? Can you try once going just from one to four and originating it um, in a circular motion from here? It's like sort of back and over. Yeah. Okay, cool. A little less than that, but yes. Right. <laughs> Yeah, and then once you get towards, if you can keep your elbow around and your, your arm around so that you have a nice squared up position here is. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, and I overshot it, but. No worries. Um, by the with this new like shifting technique, you're gonna overshoot it a lot at first, um, and it's just a matter of getting used to it, right. because you need to use so much less small small muscle energy when you're doing this, that you're used to needing to really, really needing to like go up there, but when your arm is doing so much of the work for you, you're, I mean, just being real with you, you're gonna be overshooting it a lot at first, and then as you start to get used to it you'll enter much more of a comfort zone after a while. Great. Um, the other thing is, have you ever learned about like the different types of shifts? You know, I have, and it's been such a long time that I totally forget what they are. Well, there are two, there are two broad categories of shifts and they go by a variety of names. I've heard them referred to as French and Russian shifts. I've heard them referred to as helicopter and airplane shifts. Mm -hmm. I've heard them referred to as old finger and new finger shifts. But the, I'll, I'll just call them French, French and Russian for now. No, I'll call them old finger and new finger because it makes the most sense. Old finger, you shift up with the old finger and then you plop the new finger down when it's time. Old finger shift is when you sort of have the new finger that you're going to be using begin down here or up there and then go down or go up. So, so instead of it's, and they're both very useful for, for different, um, for different uh, applications. For example, in the Tchaikovsky's fourth symphony in the slow movement, there's this big cello excerpt. Uh, it helps to get that D flat in there with your first finger as like an anchor point and it's really elegant and it fits with the harmony. But if you're doing, say, Rococo variations, uh, then you might want to just zoom it up there with, with the, um, the new finger. Um, Sort of thing you, you get used to realizing which shift is going to be the best for which piece just over time sort of yeah i mean it it part of it is just a judge of the care uh, a judgment of the character of the music sure. um for example uh what what are your favorite things in the cello repertoire i mean i honestly love the swan the classic um the uh Elgar, or sorry, the Faure, um well, the Elgar Concerto is one of my favorites for sure. But then the, the Faure Opus 24 I've been really um, into these days as well. Is that the Elegy or A Poison Rêve? The Elegy, yes. Okay. Um, so I'll, I'll use the Swan as an example um, because it is something 
that I think has places where you can do both kinds of those, and it's something that everybody adores. So, um, uh, here's one where I would do like a really slidey shift on the same finger without doing because that's unnecessary. Right. Um, you don't. Oh, sorry. Uh, that's not really. It it could be nice actually. Now that I did it, but it's it's not how I envision it. I en as this really reaching gesture. Um, and so that's that's a place where I would opt for that. Um, it's a misnomer to call it a new finger shift in here since it's just the same finger, but there's no, the old finger shifts usually are dealing with using something as an intermediary. Um, but uh, going on, uh, uh, here you can do, You might want to do an old finger shift there, or not even an old finger shift, but one where you sort of go up to a different finger first and then place it. So you because get just that intonation a little bit clearer before you. It helps the intonation, yes. And it also, I think it can fit in, it might be a little odd there, but I think one could sell it as fitting within the character of that. Because mm -hmm. it's more of a sort of gentle gesture and elegant as compared to this, this reaching thing. But also, it fits in the harmony, I think. Right. Um, are, are you a, a music theory buff? No, sadly, I, I could be much better at my theory. <laughs> That's all right, but do you know about diminished chords? Mm -hmm. I do. Right, so this, you have this tritone here. And you, if you put this first finger in as an intermediary, it just fills in the chord nicely. Right, right. That's so lovely. that's something that you could sell, I think. Yeah. Um, so it, it's sort of a, for me, an amalgamation of considering style and the theory behind it um, and just the character that you, that you want to go for. Um, the, I gave, the example that I gave you before was from the Elgar Concerto. Um, oh, yes. The fourth. <laughs> so here, I think you can really do one of those old finger shifts, and I think it's a great option. You're filling in the E minor chord, and then here, you can do that other kind of shift and just, just like, juice oh, your way into it. Because it's just so juicy. Um, right. But um, the big, I know I'm like throwing a lot of stuff at you, but it, um, it it's, it's a, shifting is a big world. Um, it's also definitely helpful when you're practicing to start doing your shifts as uh, old finger shifts. So even at the beginning of the swan, uh, <laughs> instead just to sort of suss out where that positioning is right. um, that's not the greatest example because it's not the kind of thing where it's as reliant on accuracy as something else because you kind of just shimmy your way up there right right but um it's uh those are sort of the basics that i think about when i'm dealing with shifting and when I've talked about all of this, I've had shifting up in mind. Shifting yeah. down has its differences. Um, I'll be very honest and say that it, to this day, gives me a lot of trouble. Um, but downshifting still has uh, the arm as a major player. Yeah. So one place that always gave me trouble was in, you know, the Schumann Concerto? Mm-hmm. 
That was all. That's always made me really nervous. Right, all of the little movements up here. <laughs> yeah, well, I feel like I, I feel like I'm on a on a tightrope at a at, on, at a circus, <laughs> but um, so one way to practice downshifting is. is doing a lot of sliding. That can be good for upshifting too, but I think, especially for me, it helps with downshifting. Cause just for, we're used to shifting up. I think it's maybe because we're so used to having gravity on our side. Um, and then when we have to go the other way, at least for me, it, it causes some, some issues. And so I think really sussing out those positions is important, but also, Uh, also, again, remembering that you probably have more time than you think. Because I'll try, I'll try this again, and I bet it'll feel like an eternity to me, and it'll sound in time to you. It absolutely, yeah. It, it, fe it felt like forever to me. Um, right. Not exactly so, as it should, so. there's there's also a brain training element to this definitely um there's uh, our minds are funny things and they like to i i i'm guessing I, i'm not a scientist but my guess would be that because it seems to happen to me mostly in, in difficult passages i think and i'm i'm guessing it could be an adrenaline thing um, that makes more sense, yeah. The fight or flight. Um, but those are those are like some of the baseline shifting things that I think about. No, that's very helpful. Thank you. Because I think a lot of times Good. my brain would just think about, okay, get to this position with little to no regard of how to get there. Just make sure you get there somehow. So that's very helpful. Thank you. You know what they say, it's all about the journey, not the destination. Right. <laughs> it's true. I mean, but that's the, not um, entirely true, but... Right, right. With that adrenaline of, like, you know you have to reach a high note, and if you don't hit it, it's going to be very obvious. Um, I think, yeah, that really kicks in. So. Yeah, it's... Um, I'm still working to train my brain to sort of be less in fight-or-flight mode. Sure, yes. Um, and the thing that I'm working with right now is um i don't know if you play for people a lot or if you um perform a lot but um i mean i'm sure you've been on stage and you can yes. you can commiserate with me that it can be a very scary experience mm -hmm. um and the thing that's starting slowly to help me out here is um and it, it b believe me, it's not perfect, and I'm still working on it, and I can't assimilate it right now because I can't perform for anybody. But um, that's neither here nor there. Right? Now. What I what I've been trying to think about when I do perform, though, is why I stepped into the concert hall in the first place. Um, and this is more of a this is not a technical thing. This is a philosophical thing more, but. Um, I think one of the keys to helping me sort of calm down on stage will be remembering that the reason I go onto that stage is not to um, tell some people in the audience that I can hit a note. It's because I want to forge a connection with them. And the more, the more that I can truly get in my head that I'm there just to be connecting with people, and that I can trust my practice, the better I play. Um, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I find if you trust that you're prepared, that's a lot of it too. Yeah, definitely. Um, uh, I heard a, a story from a, a famous conductor whose parents were, were string players, and his father was once asked if he ever got nervous, and he said, of course not, I'm always prepared, which uh, that would be a great, 
state of mind to be in. I'm not, right. I don't feel like that even when I am ne really prepared necessarily, but me either, but that's amazing. Yeah. If I I know I'm I'm jealous of that state of mind. But okay. he um he uh, yes, of course, the trusting of your preparation is important. And what I'm trying to do, I guess, and I I, I think probably a lot of people are trying to do is assimilate the trust in their preparation that they have in their head into sort of making it so that this fear doesn't manifest itself as much. Right. Um, but that, that, that's, that's less of a cello technique and more of a mental philosophy. Important to think about that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, <laughs> definitely. And it all, it all integrates. Um, yeah. You wanted to talk about vibrato too. Yes, please. If we have a bit of time, that would be great. We got time. I don't have anywhere to be. <laughs> weird. Um, so, um, vibrato. First of all, how do you think about vibrato? Ooh, that's a great question. Um, I suppose I think about it as coming from my wrist almost, or just no. Um, I suppose the, the best answer to that question is I hardly think about it. I just sort of try to do it, you know? <laughs> right. Um, the one thing that concerns me is the uh, wanting to jump to thinking about the wrist. Um, because it's like, um, I was trying to think of a good analogy, but I couldn't. It's OK. Um, Basically, though, what you're doing is, and this is a lot of cello playing, what you're doing is distilling, you're taking movements from large muscles and distilling them into a more finesse thing with the use of smaller muscles. And such is the case with vibrato. Um, because vibrato, for me, and I actually have relatively recently been finally, I think, starting to assimilate this into my technique. It comes from the forearm. Mm -hmm. um, so you, you want to have a good uh, forearm shake going, and you want to allow that. I find it actually important to even do it away from the cello, like, like if you're turning a, opening a jar or something, I think is one way I was taught this. Yeah. Um, and just get that forearm so that it's really, uh, moving and then let it translate into your hand. See, yeah. The other things are, uh, when I was first learning vibrato, my, my teacher gave me two things, uh, as suggestions to use. And I think these could be helpful to revisit also as you're working on sort of finessing your vibrato. <laughs> And they are things that a lot of people just have lying around their houses. Uh, number one is a tissue. Um, mm -hmm. But as I always tell people when I recommend this, only use a tissue that's not one of those fancy ones that has lotion in it, because that's going to hurt the fingerboard. Drape the tissue over the fingerboard. I'll demonstrate with a chamois cloth, because that's what I have handy. Drape it over the fingerboard and use that as sort of a preliminary vibrato exercise, because what this will do is it'll cut down on the resistance and it'll allow you to get these really wide motions that eventually you can remove this and then you can finesse them later. Wow. Yeah. That's wonderful. I've never, um, the yeah. other, the other suggestion that she gave me was, um, and I don't have one of these handy, but, uh, if you have one and, uh, you can grab it in your next practice session or something, a tennis ball and, Get the tennis ball in your hand like this and sort of rock it back and forth on the string, which will help you get that really rolling sensation in the hand that will eventually translate to this rolling and this having vibrato come out of it. So this... Um, that's where you want to get your vibrato from is the forearm. Because if I do it, if I take your, your favorite concerto and I do it just with the wrist... Like, 
it can sound good, but it's not going to sound as open and rich. Uh, because what vibrato is really mainly is a coloring agent. Um, and you want it to therefore be able to, when used tastefully, imbue as much richness as you can into your sound. So if it's coming from the forearm, it makes it so that it's much, there's much broader uh, resonance and, and, uh, and quality of the tone. Can you try just on a B here or something to make the most wide and disgusting vibrato that you can? <laughs> All right, yeah, that's pretty gross. But pretty gross. <laughs> <laughs> but that's that's okay because that's what you want here, because you want to take this this like large muscle movement, and now you want to distill it a little bit. So you want to take now this, this idea of the very powerfully moving forearm and tone it down a little bit, but also allow it to translate into smaller, but also very relaxed movements in the left hand. And then I sense that your left hand is a little tight right now. For an exercise, uh, take your thumb off the neck for a second and let it just hang down. Oh, great, yeah. Yep. Now bring the thumb back, but don't let it exert any pressure on the neck at all. That's how you want it. You want it to just kind of chill there. There it is. Great. Nice. Thank you. That was helpful. It's nice uh, this little zoom screen watching my forearm move is helpful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely. I, I'm a big advocate of mirror practice. Um, do you want to try the other fingers? You said you were having an issue with the fourth finger? Yeah, it just gets a little, a little sticky, but... Right. I, no, I think I see what it is. Um, the issue is that uh, this part of the finger right here is flattening on the string. Um, and so when it's flattened and there's more of the actual when there's more surface area on the, of the finger on the string, it gives it more more resistance and it makes it harder to actually get a good vibrato. So if you bring the left elbow up a little bit, um, that's going to help you get a round, not quite that much, but it's going to help you get a rounder hand. And when you have the rounder hand, it's going to help you keep less actual skin on the string. And then once you have that, it should hopefully be easier to keep your pinky up. Feels like a start for sure. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's an angles game. Right, that makes sense. Um, so, yeah, it's. I was telling a, a student of mine, it's like actually in both arms because there are good reasons to have elbows at a good angle for both arms, not too high, but at a good angle for maneuvering the cello. I told him to think about like he's got water wings on in the pool, and they're just <laughs> kind of holding him up and keeping them really relaxed but in a good position so that you can you can really take advantage of all four fingers in the best way that you can absolutely instead of just shifting to avoid the fourth finger <laughs> right i mean don't get me wrong uh most cellists 
maybe not most, but a lot of cellists have a weaker fourth finger than their other ones. And it's just sort of the nature of the beast because it's such a small digit. Um, and like, I'll admit if I need to go to like a really juicy note, I'm probably not gonna choose four. Um, but that doesn't mean it's not helpful to try and build it up as best you can. Uh, Cause you still want it to be uh, an option like uh, Brahms, Brahms uh, third piano quartet. There's uh, there's that spot where I want to use four in this big melodic line, and so I need to have it as much. So I need to have my vibrato going as as well as I can. So there. There are places where it's more or less unavoidable. Um, but it's, I think you're off to a really good start with it. It's, it's like I said, it's just an angles game. And it's, it's also a matter of, with a lot of the stuff that we've talked about today, it's a matter of vigilance and of just um, basically trying to always be aware of yourself and what's going on. Um, and that's something in and of itself that takes practice. But the longer that you do that, the better that they're going to become um, instincts. And you you still may need to go back once you really have it down pat every you know year, six months, whatever, and revisit them for a little bit just to make sure that they stay fresh. But it's something that will, I think, eventually begin to assimilate much more into your playing if you're really, really vigilant about it. Yeah, thank you so much. Of course. Were there any other questions that you had today? Um, I don't think so. Those were the main things that I was just thinking, like during this time, I would like to really focus on those elements of technique to, to strengthen, so really mm -hmm. appreciate this. Oh, my pleasure. and. Uh, I appreciate you contributing to the global cello community. Oh, yeah. And I think it's gonna be a really fun project and I'm looking forward to having a bunch of videos up. Yeah, I um, look forward to watching and learning from the rest of them, so thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Tally, for joining me in this online cello class and thank you to all of you for watching. I look forward to seeing you in the next video, but for now, stay safe and healthy, especially nowadays, and take care. See you soon.